welcome um, to all of our uh, customers from all over the world. As I was preparing for this presentation, I was trying to find out where all our customers were from. As you can see, they are from all over the world. Some of you have traveled a long distance to be here. Others have negotiated traffic early in the morning in the Bay Area. So thank you very much uh, for being here today. Uh, we're very happy um, that you are here. Uh, as you know, this is the first annual Aerospike User Conference. And um, when Brian, Brian Bukowski and I started the project, so to speak, um, we had a very simple goal. Our goal was to build a database product that can handle internet scale applications. The reason we came to that was both of us um, earlier had worked in internet companies and we had struggled multiple times to build really good read-write applications you know, effectively on classic databases. Um, and essentially what happened was, um, I think when we met, uh, Brian had actually worked with, I want to give a shout out to GP, who was an early contributor uh, to the project with Brian, who couldn't join us in Aerospike. But when Brian and I met, Brian sent me some code. He said, go try it out. And what I did was, I had a long flight from San Francisco to Singapore, I think. So I fired it up on my laptop, uh, just to see how fast we go. And essentially, somewhere, 30,000 feet, I guess, I was trying this, and I couldn't believe my eyes. thought I was hallucinating, and the performance was unbelievable in my life. I'd never seen, I'm a database person, you know, uh, worked in the field for a long time before I went to the internet applications area, and I was just shocked at the performance. And then, what we wanted to do, and, and this is the other thing we had done, you know, when we met, we had done a back of the envelope calculation uh, of what it would cost to deploy such a database. And there we were standing on the shoulders of giants, literally. You know, Intel, who's here, you know, Micron, Samsung, they had invented flash technology. And it was just amazing what we could do in terms of TCO. So what we had was something which was 10x better than everything else that I knew of and Brian knew of in the market. And it was going to be 10x lower TCO than everything else. And we were the first to market, so to speak. You know, that's where we started, and um, it's been an interesting journey. And to come here after eight years with all of you um, who have trusted us and deployed us in mission critical um, applications worldwide, uh, that's really satisfying, and we want to build on that. So let me kind of talk a little bit about how we founded the company and how we got here. You know, what were the key aspects of this journey? So when I think of a journey, and I was thinking, what is the metaphor I want to use? And this is actually a picture of uh, an actual banyan tree in my hometown in Chennai. Um, the way a banyan tree grows is it kind of, I think it uh, takes over some other tree, but eventually it grows a trunk. Uh, but uh, it, once the branches come out, the branches start to put out roots. And then sometimes these roots, and which form out of the secondary branches, are as big or bigger than the original trunk it started from. And it continues like this. And this particular tree uh, is an Adyar in the Theosophical Society in Chennai. And uh, it was started before the British showed up in India. And it's still there. It covers about 50,000 square feet or something. And it's a whole in, you know, ecosystem. So if you look at our journey, you know, where, where we started, um, this is interesting. Brian and I started the company in 2009. And then we are, of course, coding something. And we are um, writing code, trying to fund, you know, fund it and all that. But you would think that the first branch that came out of this uh, would be an investor, maybe other employees. No, it was a customer. You know, our first customer, AppNexus, I don't know if Tim is in the audience, but he's going to speak in the afternoon. Um, essentially, AppNexus took a huge bet on us. And, and there are a lot of lessons we learned from that first interaction. And there, if you will, you know, we, you know, Brian and I had built this little tree, so to speak. The first big branch which came out was really AppNexus. And several instructive things on that story. The first one was AppNexus was already at internet scale and actually struggling to uh, continue to grow, which was actually their whole point, was to grow fast. They were in ad tech and digital you know, advertising, and they had gotten stuck with the existing products. 
when they trialed Aerospike, they immediately saw the 10x improvements in both performance and the 10x um, reduction in cost based on flash storage. And that was actually uh, definitely the first important moment for us. But Appnex has also used us for one of their most mission critical um, applications in, the, in their stack. And they continue to use us, use us today. So this, is kind of, this kind of tells you the kind of journey we've had is customers who came and started using Aerospike. Um, I would not say that they became successful just because they used Aerospike, but the kinds of decision processes they used to find the best possible solution um, in every area, and one of those areas happens to be Aerospike, has, has stood them in, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, stood the test of time. Um, and then what happens is uh, the branch of the, the banyan tree puts down roots, right? I mean, essentially what Appnex has did for us um, is priceless in the sense that they publicly talked about the benefits they got from using Aerospike. And immediately we got 10 more customers with, you know, in the next year uh, because everybody started calling us. If Appnex is using you at scale, then maybe we should try it out. All we have ever asked customers is to try us out. You know? And then once you try us out, you make a decision based on objective criteria. Uh, you know, if the use case matches, we usually win the deal and then everybody's happy and, and they can grow fast. So that is, those are the kind of instructive things that we had in the first branch. It set up roots, and now you know, we are pretty well known uh, all through ad tech. Uh, we have repeated that with other pioneering customers in other areas, you know, uh, notably in telco, uh, where we have a large um, telco in India, which standardized on us. You know, there are other um, telco providers like Nokia, which used us. So essentially, a, a, you know, another branch formed, and it set some roots, and we're expanding in there. And the latest one, the most recent one we are engaged in is in financial services, you know, and I think uh, we have some of our uh, early friends from financial services here. PayPal will present later today, uh, and Schwab is also here. Essentially, uh, they have helped us uh, put out another branch and another route and another kind of portion of the ecosystem in that. And then, on a different note, uh, geographically, uh, we've also expanded. And that's, again, very interesting because uh, the three or four markets I will quickly mention, you know, Japan, you know, and our first customer in Japan is here. You know, Yasuda-san has um, you know, kindly come, you know, traveled all the way from Tokyo to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, but also, um, and then of course, once, once we were there, you know, because of Yasuda-san, he probably got several other customers because he liked what we did and he used it. And this is the kind of the theme you will see uh, over and over again. And this is one of the reasons our customers, you know, we built a company, you know, John likes to say, uh, brick by brick, we built it customer by, cu customer, by customer, or branch by branch in the, in the banyan tree and expanding it. Um, also, uh, you know, in India and China, um, we are uh, organically uh, kind of growing because of the same kind of um, behavior that we are seeing, you know, uh, in terms of you know, large customers using us at scale, everybody else learning about it, and then trying us out, and then we expand. Um, I want to call out one specific area uh, where we have a particularly you know, brilliant partner, also named Brillix. Uh, I think Ami is here somewhere. Uh, and essentially, in Israel, there's another big, strong branch formed, and our customer there, I think, is going to talk. Uh, you know, Ido is here uh, from AppsFlyer. He's going to speak also. So I encourage you to attend these customer presentations because whatever uh, I say, you know, I'm still from Aerospike. Uh, it may or may not be biased. I try not to be biased, but who knows? Right? I mean, I've worked with this for eight years. I won't even know if I'm biased. So um, essentially, uh, you, should, you should make your judgment based on what our customers say about uh, using Aerospike. But really, you know, just learn what they went through. I think that's itself useful in general. Um, so, you know, going, moving on from, OK, so now we have this whole ecosystem of customers which is forming. Um, after our first customer, you know, I do want to have a, you know, uh, give a shout out to our investors who also did bet on us um, and we had a couple of customers. And that is one thing about us, you know, Brian and I, you know, it's worth mentioning, is we really didn't want to build a product and then try to get an investor into it uh, before we could prove it out in production. So literally, Brian and I were supporting it 24 by 7 for a few months uh, before our, uh, you know, at internet scale. And it was something which kind of informs uh, the next topic I want to touch upon, which is how we built our team. So as soon as we got our investors uh, involved, uh, we could now afford to have a team. And the first thing we decided was to have a distributed team. It is not the normal thing people do, but then we knew from our experience with our early customers that we are a 24 by 7 company. And even if you had four people, we needed two people in a different time zone. 
That's literally how we started. And two of those kind of, I would say, superstars, people who I would trust my life with, you know, are right here. You know, one is Andy, you know, out of Mountain View, another one is Sunil out of Bangalore. And it was 12 hours different, it was great. We could do, you know, I could actually sleep at night after that, and Brian and I, you know, once Sunil came on board. These were like fundamental kind of um, learnings that we had uh, as we went through the system. And you will see that in our support team, which is, uh, you know, which is essentially 24 by seven. Uh, we have expanded the team since then. Uh, we have, of course, uh, I, I mentioned Mountain View and Bangalore. We have people all over the US, you know, in Utah, in the East Coast, in Denver, uh, but also in London, in Europe, uh, and Berlin, as well as uh, people in Singapore. So we are a global company, even though uh, we are not a large company in terms of people, we are well distributed to be able to handle um, the, the list of uh, customers you saw earlier. Now, it's all good. So we got a team which is working well. We got customers. Um, and then this banyan tree continues to grow. So what exactly have we learned from this journey? Right? And this is, these are three words. It just works. We heard from our first, uh, first time I heard it was sometime in 2012. This was from a customer. Okay? And there are several reasons why people said it. And then the, the the last time, the latest time I've heard it was last week in Israel. Um, and, and it was like a shock for me to hear it, a pleasant shock, obviously, uh, to see that uh, we are achieving some of the goals we've set ourselves to achieve. But let me talk a little bit about the details of things that go behind our thinking as to what is important to us, right? We always wanted to have a product which works. You know, it's easy to say that. It is very hard to execute is what we have learned. And we have learned along the way a lot of things. Many of our customers try a lot of solutions before they come to Aerospike. The reason is this is an internet scale problem. And um, in spite of all the people who are here, Aerospike is not as well known outside this room as, as it should be, and it will get there. And because of which, people actually try out a lot of things they're familiar with. But for a certain problem, we are about 10 times better and 10 times better in TCR, maybe five times better in TCR. You've got to do the calculation on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it is hard to believe that such a product can actually exist because given, and that will change over time. It's already changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, but that is kind of what we were um, fighting, fighting over the last few years. But what have we learned from it is, it's very simple. We need to kind of invest in quality. And we've spent a lot of time uh, hiring people. We don't have a large engineering team, uh, but we have spent our time to hire the best possible talent and allow them the ability to develop. It takes time. Our product is hard, and we actually love doing it, but we have to give it the respect it deserves in terms of difficulty and, and figure out the right solutions so that our customers can benefit. One of the important things we've learned, and this came from some of our friends in financial services, is they always look at it and say, you know, the moment the customer says it just works, it's all awesome, they figure it out, they go like, don't break it. <laughs> and, and that's a brilliant advice, okay? And therefore, what does not breaking it mean? Not breaking it means that don't go off and build some feature which has nothing to do with your core competency in the interest of grabbing some big market share in some, with a pipe dream, just try to do it organically and expand the market. That's exactly what we have done, right? I said we were, you know, in the beginning that Brian and I wanted to build a database that is essentially very fast. And we were surprised at the speeds we generated, uh, in, you know, in spite of the fact we believed in it, you know. Uh, and, and we actually thought through that it would happen. That when it happened, it was still a surprise. But then, Sometime in 2011, we actually put out a press release. Uh, this was around the same time that we announced AppNexus. And we said, uh, and exactly what the founding principle was, we said, we will have a database which is this fast, but which is also consistent. It took us seven years to get the consistency stuff done. It was really hard. And I know that from a database point of view, uh, that it is hard. But I did not realize it was this hard. And the reason it was hard for us is be because we had to add these strong consistency features without breaking that it just works, right? without breaking the performance. The reason people said it just works is because they tried all these other things which were just not up to the mark for internet scale uh, certain read write applications, which were really critical for the success of most of the customers we have. So we had to keep that. 
And it took us a while to figure out how to do that. And I think it is a testament to our you know, hand-picked so-called engineering team that they have been able to achieve that milestone. Having done that, it is really important for us to cover the entire key value space. So you know, Brian will talk more about it. Uh, but essentially, we want to just own the key value database space end to end regardless of any use case on any particular technology that you are running it on. You know, getting on a little bit of the hardware stuff, right? So what have we learned about hardware? I mean, the investments I talk about uh, by the giants of the industry, like Intel, Micron, you know, uh, Samsung, et cetera, and Scaleflux, a partner of ours, you know, uh, there are a lot of these um, uh, innovations in storage which are happening, and I assure you that Aerospike is at the forefront of utilizing these technologies to unlock them for database applications so that you can continue to scale at lower TCO than virtually everything else out there. This is actually a founding goal for us. We continue to stay true to it. And that essentially is also mean it just works because it continues to keep working. Because it, it works yesterday is nobody cares really. I mean, this is Silicon Valley or you know, the world doesn't care about yesterday. It cares about tomorrow. And we are all about tomorrow because that's where our partners are, and we want to keep pace with them. And therefore, we have strong partnerships with all of these companies, and that's one thing we have learned. You know? uh, we can't do everything ourselves. As a small team, we are forced to learn that very early. You know, when Brian and I were supporting everything, we realized we needed help, and we were not afraid to ask it. We are not interested in, you know, as a team, we decentralize quite a, quite a bit, and all of that really helps in making sure you know, our company is working 24 by 7. So when I'm asleep, you know, Asia is awake. And when all of us here are asleep, it's awake, and it's fully functional for a customer. And that's really important from the beginning. And we have kind of managed to achieve it so far. We hope to continue to do that. So having said all of this, so what, what is the, um, I'd like to close with just a thought. Uh, and this thought came, you know, uh, I, th you know I believe Don Hatterley, uh, the, um, father of IBM DB2, he founded that project in IBM and saw it to completion and I mean, enormous success. He's with us today. He was one of the, he is one of the earliest advisors, in fact, the first advisor for Aerospike in a technical sense in the database area since 2009. And he's, he's guided us. He has kind of shared with us his valuable experience of building a database product and making it successful in enterprises in the world. And he actually challenged Brian and I uh, a few months ago so what is it that you want out of this product, he said. And then the, the actual words he used was, well, you guys are over 50. What the heck are you going to do? You know, what, do you, what, what are you going to do when you retire? What are you going to think about when you retire? It's not that far away. It's kind of hardly anybody thinks about it. But Don's really different in a lot of ways. And, and it was an interesting challenge. And, and Brian and I thought, thought about it really carefully. And we said, what we want is to build a product that survives us, just like Don built a product that survived him at IBM. And it continues to thrive in various ways. That's what we are about. We are about make solving problems which are eternal in the computing space. You know, there are uh, um, uh, some of the you know there, there there is a part you know there's a customer here from a large bank um, who has been running on a mainframe for 25 plus years. Aerospike has run for about um, seven and a half years in production. With you know, it's been live with virtually no downtime and all that, it's pretty good. But 25 years is a lot larger than seven and a half years. That's what we aspire to. So I will leave you with that thought, and now I'd like to invite our CEO, John Dillon, to share his thoughts. I've got a short few thoughts that I think are germane, probably specifically germane to this audience. This is a quote. It might look like something you've heard recently. Everything is impossible until it's done. Everything is impossible until it's not. It turns out that was first said in the first century AD by Pliny the Elder. He was using that comment to talk about innovation and progress in Roman society. All of us here are innovators. We're entrepreneurs of a fashion. We're pioneers. 
We're on trails that are untrodden. And yet, 2,000 years later, a very famous and well-known but somewhat controversial paper was written by Nicholas Carr. And he stated provocatively that IT does not matter. That created a hubbub, as you can imagine. Big IT companies immediately tried to shout them down. But there's nuance in what he said. And I think it's worth understanding it. He used the example of electricity finding its way into America in the 1880s. And in essence, what he is saying is that infrastructure, when it's new, provides opportunity for innovation. But then when it becomes completely ubiquitous, everyone has it, it's a commodity. We're in a hotel room, the lights are on, we don't expect them to be off. If they were off, that would be a risk element for the hotel and for us. But if we take it for granted, everyone has electricity today. So his comment about infrastructure and IT was based on the idea that there's only a finite window when it's scarce, and an organization can use it to gain advantage. But that advantage will be fleeting when the technology becomes ubiquitous and a commodity. So in his electrical example, what was interesting is America was going through the part of the Industrial Revolution, and we had factories. We had lots of factories, especially in the Northeast. And electricity happened. And factories were run by water wheels, hooked to the side of a building with gears and pulleys and levers, very, very complex to deliver power to the workstations that were manufacturing the goods. So kind of an interesting point to consider was some innovation happened where manufacturers took their factory up to a hydroelectric plant. But then what they did is they just removed the big water wheel and put a big motor in to drive all the gears and all the pulleys and all the levers. It was a single point of failure. It wasn't very efficient. Those gears, those levers, those pulleys were cumbersome, expensive, fraught with accidents, hard to maintain. But innovation in manufacturing went further than that. True innovators realized that electricity could be distributed. And instead of having one motor at the side of the building, they ran the wires throughout the factory to the workstations and embedded motors in those workstations and completely revolutionized manufacturing in America and gained unbelievable competitive advantage that probably lasted 30 years, until the 20s, the 10s. So if you think about that, I think the real argument here isn't that IT doesn't matter, it's a question of when it matters. And I would argue that there are points in time, windows in our history where IT has mattered and has provided the opportunity for disintermediation and innovation. About 40 years ago, the relational database emerged. That gave us a whole new construct for data and data management. I think it also revolutionized the notion of open systems in as much as databases in the past, before this, were hardwired to the hardware vendor. If you bought a data general machine, it had a database. If you bought a, a DEC machine, an IBM machine, whatever the machine was, the database was built in. And as a consumer of that database, who built applications on top of it, if you needed more horsepower, the only thing you had left to do was go back to the company who sold you the first machine and buy a bigger one. Otherwise, you were stuck rewriting the entire application. So we ended up with software becoming portable and trans transportable across platforms. And that was very, very revolutionary at the time and created, I think, an influx of innovation. We had the advent of the Apple computer and then the IBM PC, which democratized compute. It also gave rise to an architectural concept called client-server, which is still employed today. Then we had the year 2K. I'm not sure that was innovation, but boy, did we spend a lot of money re-engineering back offices. Lots of ERP systems everywhere. Uh, just before the year 2000 when people thought planes were going to fall out of the air when the, when the minute hand clipped over to the next year. Today, we have digital, digital transformation. And each one of these things, I think, is a window in time for innovation. And we are right 
at the forefront of one of those innovative periods. And let me tell you, it's got to do with big data. There is so much data, it inherently is a tsunami. It is, it's overwashing companies, businesses, industries. The transformative changes that are already beginning that we can see in our day-to-day -day lives are astounding. You might not know this, but we create 2.5 million terabytes of new data every day. That's 2.5 exabytes. I don't know how long it would take, but it won't take long to double the amount of data that we have today on the planet since the beginning of mankind. Uh, that's staggering. And of course, the question is, what do you do with that data? There are 3.7 billion humans online today. 3.7 billion. That's a half. The entire population of the globe. And they're everywhere. And then, of course, we have an enormous number of telematic devices that are also inundating us with data. So the question is, what do you do with this unprecedented volume of data? The data loads are skyrocketing, data set sizes are growing, transactional volumes are through the roof, stringent latency requirements exist, and of course cost is always an issue. So if you are an organization, you have to think about this. And the discussion here around the digital transformation is happening in boardrooms, executive suites, technology teams, and throughout organizations to figure out, does this matter to us? I spent a lot of years in the business intelligence space. We used to have an expression that said that our clients were data rich, but knowledge poor. Well, now we have so much data, everyone is completely inundated and a wash in data. So the question is, what do you do with it? Well, the data in essence is raw ore. It's raw material. It's a natural resource. And it can be mined, but I prefer to say it can be farmed. And you can use the data for so many different things. But it takes a combination of technologies, innovative ideas, and ultimately this change in data volumes creates unprecedented opportunity but it also creates existential threat. So if I take a look at the choice, we can either innovate or not. We cannot stop the wave, but we can master it. We can apply technology to the data and we can use it for innovation. And so the whole point is today is a very, very good day to be innovative. Now, innovation is a journey. It implies that you're trying to do something that was heretofore impossible or not done before. So it's a journey. It's sailing through uncharted waters. And that's a challenge. As Srini said, we feel like we're on this challenge and this journey with you. And if you see existential threat, it's everywhere. The disintermediation is crazy. I took an Uber cab the other day. I live in San Francisco. I didn't think, I just pull out my phone and I got it. I've stood on the corner for a half an hour waiting for a DeSoto cab to show up, and now I know where the cab is, I know where it comes, and Uber doesn't own a taxi. We have things like cryptocurrencies, we stream videos. When was the last time any of you walked into a branch bank and actually conducted a banking transaction with a teller? This disintermediation and this innovation is everywhere and it's around us. So we are very pleased to be on this journey with you. The opportunity to apply technology is here and it's now. There's so much that can be done with the data. You can improve stakeholder experience, optimize supply chains, reduce costs, delight end users, improve brand, improve security, and gain competitive advantage. Now maybe that competitive advantage won't last 100 years, but competitive advantage that gives you a five year head start over your rivals or allows you to gain market share, those things are priceless and now is the time to do it. So as I said, we feel that we're on this journey with you. We will partner with you, we will support you, we'll help you succeed. We've got your back. We'll do whatever we can to ensure that success. And I'm here to tell you that it was the focus that the company had from the very beginning when Brian and Srini 
started the company, it's where we are today, and we will be faithful to that promise and that commitment. That's our guarantee, that's our pledge, that's who we are, and I want you to hear that. I want to hear it from me, but it's how we all feel.